Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar from Cover to Cover, a systems approach to cover cropping with Adam Kramer from Black Sand Granary. I'm Kelsey Virgin, and I'm a project manager with Pasture Project at the Wall Center, who is hosting this webinar today, along with Danny Heisler from Valley Stewardship Network. To start us off, I'm uh, first gonna go over the, the logistics and how-tos for the webinar system. Then I will talk briefly about the Pasture Project and Valley Stewardship Network and our partnership. Then we will do some audience polling where some questions will appear on your screen. And after that, we'll get into our presentation. Then we will have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. The Pasture Project is part of the Resilient Agriculture and Ecosystems Initiative of the Wall Center at Winrock International. Pasture Project works to advance and integrate regenerative grazing as a scalable market-driven solution for building healthy soil, viable farms, and resilient communities in the upper Midwest, and specifically in a six-state region in the upper Mississippi River Basin, although we do work with some national audiences. Valley Stewardship Network, or VSN, works to promote protect land and water through research, education, and community involvement in the Kickapoo and neighboring watersheds in Wisconsin. VSN provides educational resources, workshops, and conservation assessments to increase farm BMPs for the water watershed stewardship. VSN also facilitates the formation and support activities of a farmer-led led watershed council. Pasture Project and VSN, along with Tanner Creek Farmer-Led Watershed Council, have partnered together to form the Tanner Creek Grazing Project. This three-year project provides grazing resources and education support to regenerative grazing in the watershed. The project goal is to work with farmers and landowners in the Tanner Creek watershed to directly reduce nutrient and sediment loss through adoption of regenerative grazing practices. Examples of supported practices include conversion of cropland to pasture, transition from continuous to rotational grazing, and the use of cover crops as forage. And this webinar is part of our education and outreach efforts. Please visit our websites or contact us for more information about our work and to stay up to date on future webinars. Before we introduce our speaker, we're going to do some audience polling to help us get a feel for who's in the room. The first question is, what is the primary role you currently have in farming? Looks like about half, more than half agency, nonprofit, university, or company staff, and then lots of row crop and mixed crop livestock producers. The next poll, last one, how many years of experience do you have with cover crops? None, one to three years, four to six years, seven to 10 years. Okay, so it looks like a good amount of y'all are pretty experienced, and then there's a lots of new beginners too, and I think that's great. Adam's presentation is going to kind of cover the whole systems approach, so I think it'll be useful information for, for all levels. On to our presenter. Adam Kramer is a graduate of Iowa State University and has been a certified crop advisor since 2006. During his 16 years in the industry, Adam has always believed that agriculture and environmental stewardship are synonymous. This focus has led to the formation of two entities located in the Driftless area of Wisconsin. Black Sand Granary is an agronomy-centered business, and Growers United is a network of demonstration farms implementing regenerative practices. These entities work to enhance soil health and improve water quality. Growers operating within this system utilize technology and comprehensive plans to measure results. Kramer believes the responsibility of stewardship rests on those touching the land most. This presents a leadership opportunity to ensure adequate nutrition and clean waters for families, communities, and generations to come. So thank you, Adam, for presenting today. I'm going to hand it off to you. Kelsey came up with the uh, title of this presentation, so I added in some stuff that uh, her and Danny uh, had met with me on a while back, and I just kind of put together really a, a bunch of presentations that we have done over the last couple of years. And I do believe in a systems approach. So it's, it's actually a good exercise for me to go back to all the nuanced stuff that we do here and compile it. I've always believed that if I have a good system, then that system can take care of me so I can do the work. And cover cropping is no different. I mean, we're not really adding something, we're changing something, and that something we are changing is our production plan. And in a systems approach, we go to the drawing board and build the, the plan holistically. So whole farm implementation plans really are our focus. And I'm gonna walk through what we do and what our approach is. I'm gonna give a little history and, and some of the special features of the Driftless area while we do that. And then uh, we'll dig into some of the demonstration 
of those implementation strategies that we've done. And then finally, uh, we'll discuss the results of our work and address some of the frequently asked questions that come along with the work that uh, we're doing. So <clears throat> we operate, um, as Kelsey said, a couple different entities here. And Black Sand Granary is the production plan business. So we're just putting stuff on paper there and making the plans. And then Growers United is a group of farmers that uh, demonstrate how to get it done. So obviously there's a fair amount of communication uh, between all of us to make sure we understand each other and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and then also there's a lot of feedback going back and forth as to uh, how to do it better. So we've, we've picked up a few things as we go. And we work primarily in the, in the dripless area, um, but specifically in Southwest Wisconsin. And those yellow blobs on the map <clears throat> are fields that we've applied uh, cover crops to with airplanes. And our main office is located right outside of Patch Grove uh, and near River Ridge School District off of Highway 18. But our physical address is Prairie du Chien, which is weird, um, but we're right outside of Patch Grove and that's just the way the post office works. So we're easy to find. Uh, we have some demonstration going on there in, in smaller plots and and the the work that we're doing there and, and elsewhere um, is in the space where stewardship and production intersect and that's just a philosophy that we've uh, grounded ourselves to um, the concept is based in soil health with the collateral effect of, of water quality and the way we achieve this is is really simple but fundamental in its approach and we we're trying to enhance that soil health and water quality with continuous cover, no-till or planting green, variable rate scripting, um, precision equipment, government uh, compliance, so 590 nutrient management standards, um, anything that's published by our, our uh, local offices that we can hook on to. And then uh, finally, extending or di diversifying our cropping rotation. So that's a pretty critical component, that last one. but. It takes all these things really to um, achieve the goals that we're reaching for. And in the dripless area, we do have some challenges. There's a, I always think it's funny, no matter what happens in our line of work, especially in the upper Midwest, um, folks always say, how's it going? And we always say, fine. And, and uh, we're probably all liars most days, but um, we do just fine around here, but we have some issues. And the topography is really neat to look at, but just not efficient to farm. So while it's highly productive, uh, we do have some steep slopes and some irregular shaped fields and keeping erosion under control is tricky. And it's, it's our biggest resource concern. So we live and work around the biggest watershed in North America and we feel like we're on the front line. According to our friends at the NRCS, upland water erosion can be eliminated with four practices, and that's never till, uh, perennial vegetation established and maintained properly, cover crops, and uh, adding small grains into rotation. So there's some challenges uh, to implementing these practices on the farm. Folks have demonstrated the short-term success with tillage, uh, and some folks don't need perennial vegetation, or they don't have access to um, you know, markets for forages, although, Locally, many do uh, to us. Cover cropping is relatively new. I think we've all seen a lot of it, but it, it is relatively new and it's not very well understood. And, and small grain, um, the, the markets just aren't as developed and, and easy to access. Another component of that uh, diversification and the rotation with small grains, um, whether it be wheat, barley, or rye, it, it can take some some know-how and experience to raise the quality to access the better markets and the expertise in our local area uh, i would say is lacking uh, also but it, it can be done and i this picture here uh, as an example is a field farmed by uh, clark view dairy um, and this is the same field uh, just two years later so we took the same planter and put some components on it, started to no-till and now we're no-tilling and also planting green. 
So Clarkview Farms is a CAFO in a, in a large dairy near Bagley, Wisconsin, and they're one of the charter members uh, at Growers United. And they're now 100% no-till and are also planting green. And, and they're really doing it successfully. So there's some tricky things getting into it, but they're figuring it out. Um, and, and before we even take it that far, I wanna take a step back and say too that what we've learned uh, and what we're promoting and consulting with folks on their farms with is, is something that we've demonstrated on our own property. And that's over in Alamakee County <clears throat> near Wacon. Iowa. And the found, like I said, the foundation of our process is being tested on this land and those fundamentals are consistent with our approach and how we farm this piece of ground. So we've done some work to control water flow and we also extended ro rotation uh, by incorporating small grains, which I'll, I'll get into that specifically here. And then uh, our, our friends at the NRSS say this is a, you know, this is the best way to do it. So we're just trying to do uh, what the science says. And, and at the same time, I'm a, a, I don't know how many generations of Lutheran have been in our family, but the Protestant in me always asks the questions, you know, what does this mean? And, and why are we doing small grains? And didn't we try that once and we're not? These questions are all uh, bouncing around for me too. And the, the answer is uh, we did, we did tried to grow small grains for a long time in this country. Uh, I think everybody knows that. There was tremendous demand for them. And it was really almost currency during the Western expansion of the European settlement in North America. You know, in the upper Midwest in particular, you had a lot of Germans uh, amongst others, but finding homes in Wisconsin. And some of the Germans were really into making beer and by 1895, Pabst and Schlitz, uh, they, they produced the most and the third most barrels of beer in this country. And I think that's quite a feat considering all the folks on the East Coast, you know, had been there for a while and been established and had a head start. Um, but one of the main reasons that the brewmasters uh, would have came to Wisconsin is that it likely felt familiar to them. Mettenheim, Germany, where the Pabst family was uh, from, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin are really right near the same latitude line. And we also experience a really similar um, climate and growing environment. You know, another, another reason uh, they would have preferred uh, the area's access to clean water uh, and, and high quality water. So we got some of the best fresh water on the planet locally and uh, water is pretty important considering 95% uh, of the beer you drink uh, is, is water. So that also begs another question, you know, why are they still making plain, plain water? Um, anyway, uh, another reason the brewmasters would have preferred the upper Midwest um, was access to local materials and port access to the Great Lakes. So the familial land served them well and they could get acclimated quickly but if you consider the lack of infrastructure back in those days, um, when all those big Milwaukee breweries were dominating the industry, a lot of that grain had to be brought in with horse-drawn or horse-powered equipment. Um, it took a lot of barley to meet the demand and Wisconsin farmers were happy to send it. So if you check these stats with me, it would have taken 77,000 acres of barley to meet the production needs of the breweries in 1895. Yet in uh, 2015, uh, Wisconsin only grew 15,000 acres of barley. So that's just a crazy shift. Um, more local stuff I think is crazy. In 1858, Victory traded 100,000 bushels of wheat. But in 2017, all of Vernon County grew 43,000 bushels of wheat. So we've gone through a tremendous uh, evolution in our production system. Uh, throughout the Midwest, but especially in the northern uh, regions where we were dominated by small grains at one time. I got to throw a shout out to Carol Fritchie uh, for the deep dive on this particular research here. She found all that stuff through public records and uh, stuff like that just really interests me because we don't want to try to grow something that can't be grown, but there's got to be a reason why folks aren't doing it. Um, you know, we stand on the shoulders of the people that 
came before us and and uh, everybody's trying to do the right thing is by and large is my opinion so what happened um you know i think we all know monocultures are just not a good way to grow crops especially continuous monoculture of the same crop um especially when we were growing a lot of small grains in this neighborhood you know your main field prep tool is a plow and these fields became overrun by pests and diseases and productivity dropped both because of this and the substantial degradation of the soil markets began to diminish and the new corn genetics came and saved the farm you know they saved the families and they saved the farm and the game just shifted so today we pretty much have forgotten more about small grains than we once knew and the industry is dominated by other crops so r d pipelines are smaller or they just don't exist and because of all that uh, it takes a relatively higher amount of management and uh, awareness of your cultural practices to raise the necessary quality to move product through the supply chain but that being said there are some new tools and we'll talk about some of those um, that are available in some great technology uh, that may make small grains a more viable option for extending that rotation once again so this is a picture of our farm and also um, details what our rotation looks like you can see what i highlighted there in the in the green portion on the top right so we grew soft red winter wheat in 2018 and now we're in the second rotation and we have Brissetto hybrid rye uh, planted this season and in the lower right is a summary of our soil test from the fall 2016 and as you can see we had some work to do um, but it wasn't overly terrible for for the area it was pretty obvious what we had to get to work on there and i'll i'll get into that in a minute uh, as I mentioned earlier, small grains take a, a bit more management to achieve the, the high end results compared to our traditional crops like corn and soy. So I went to a few meetings and, and I went right off the UW extension playbook to make this plan. Um, this, is, this is their plan uh, based off their research. And Dan Smith is our extension agent and is also a walking, talking small grains encyclopedia. So he helped me a lot uh, the immediate benefit to the rotation is noticeable out in the field but the but the greatest benefit of all and why we decided to do this uh, because of some structural problems we had in this demonstration farm is to extend that window for our cover crop seeding fall in that small grain crop and we planted that cover crop fall in the wheat on july 27th of 2018 and it really grew a lot uh, by extending our growing season for that cover crop we can plant about any kind of species in the mix that we could dream up or get access to and this this person here is neil sass he works with the nrcs in Alamakee county uh, he took the transects which measured species mix establishment and he also measured the biomass that you're seeing on this slide here and according to neil and his team there's more biomass below ground than above and in some cases total biomass can be three times uh, the above ground measurement. So we may have potentially put quite a bit of biomass in the field with that cover crop. And I'm gonna detail that with the soil sampling that we did uh, in 2019, quantify what that means to our, our soils and our uh, cropping plan. So another benefit to extending this rotation and using cover crops is the flexibility to make feed or graze that livestock uh, within the fields. So we've had folks graze, chop, uh, bale, small grains for feed. And most of the decision on how or when to make the feed is based off each operation and the goals for feed. And ultimately weather really, especially in the spring, plays an important role in the process. You know, this spring, for example, we had some dairy producers concerned about 2021 turning uh, dry and potentially seeing some drought conditions. And I think their concerns are warranted at this point. But we track uh, one of those instances closely because they had a scale um, and we could monitor which field was getting what yield. Uh, we chopped rye on April 25th and then corn was planted April 29th. So it, again, it's not often that we're going to get that window to get uh, that kind of work done that time of year. But this year we just watched the forecast and we were concerned about drought 
uh, we knew we could get it done. So we just decided to do it. And the results were pretty good. Uh, we had 137 RFQ, 189 RFV, and 20.87% protein on a dry matter basis. So it, it was uh, dairy quality feed, feed that yielded 1.1 tons of dry matter uh, chop per acre at 72% moisture. So we had about four tons of total feed per acre. And this was all scaled, right? So the corn looks tremendous uh, coming behind the rye and we really hope to make a good silage yield also. Some springs that's not gonna work, um, but at least the cover crop is out there to provide us some flexibility. And if we don't make feed, we've got the cover and um, it's just another opportunity to plant green, which is one of our main goals. Um, <clears throat> this is back at the demo farm in uh, UP8 and following that wheat crop and multi-species cover, uh, we had our volunteer wheat and a mixture of small grains that we had planted uh, come back that spring. It didn't really look like much early on in 2019, but you can see how much a difference 18 days can make on a cover crop. It came along nice. Um, we terminated the cover crop on our with our normal uh, pre-emerge program and uh, just herbicide pass plus glyphosate is the only minor change. I always prefer a burn down. Uh, anyway, but we did that on May 14th, and then we planted green on May 15th. So in the pick on the right, you can see the the trench that we had just planted through, uh, and we removed the trash whippers, and this is just disc openers in our normal uh, closing system. 13 days later, we had corn emerging through the desiccating cover, and then uh, by June 20th, we had a nice even stand of corn growing above a straw mat. And we fly our cover crops on uh, with an airplane around the end of August. And I'll get into detail on that here in a little bit. Um, but, but by the end of harvest, you know, we're going to have a nice even stand of cover crops to hold our wheel traffic and then have something to plant green into the next spring. So <clears throat> what a difference a year makes. I mean, 2019, 2020 was different. 2021, the weather's even weirder yet, I think. But um, it wasn't nearly uh, wet as wet early in 2020 and the beans are actually planted in this picture so you can see where our cover crop was on that date and um, there's really not much to document or show in, 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 in the bean crop. Beans love uh, growing next to or within a cover crop uh, so I took some pictures of the establishment there um, but I knew throughout the growing season that I was making some progress because uh, the way the beans progressed through the season, they were just so even. And then when they began to senesce, the field just changed from green to yellow to brown, you know, all together. And this was much different than the years prior when we had a uh, fairly uneven dry down and we could notice the weak spots within the field boundary. And I was constantly checking the field throughout the growing season for compaction because that was one of the main issues that we had on this farm, just really poor structure. Um, and I could see that we were alleviating that compaction layer, you know, after three years of cover cropping. But um, so I knew what I had here was more ideal soil composition and I had better pore space, I had better water infiltration, I had better water holding capacity. And the soil was really changing. I mean, it was behaving less like a conventionally tilled soil and more like a natural or undisturbed soil. And the color change was noticeable. The tilt was noticeable. Um, felt different, smelled different, looked different. Everything was changing. Um, and one of the things I was learning about while we're going through this change um, and with talking to the NRCS staff is an exudate called glomalin. And Glomalin acts as a protective coating for the hyphae of our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. I'm not going to call it that anymore during this presentation. I'll call it AMF. Um, folks at the NRCS compared uh, the glomalin to the bark on, a, on the branches of a tree. So <clears throat> while it protects the AMF hyphae, glomalin also gives our soils aggregate stability. It's just a property of that exudate. Um, our soils on the demo farm are 
transforming from really like a compacted anaerobic environment dominated more by bacteria and it was really turning into more of an anaerobic environment dominated by fungi and we were checking for it under a microscope and until after the the bean crop in 2020 we we actually did find some amf hyphae and the red arrow is pointing at it in this in this slide so this is uh, with all the help of the NRCS and their observations, we're starting, um, we're really starting to see that our field observations were matching what the science told us, you know, <laughs> should happen. So it was, it was kind of like validation, I think, and it made us really ex excited. I mean, for a nerd like me, I was getting pretty jacked up about it anyway. And, uh, I, want, I always want to figure out like what happened. Like I got to quantify that. So I was curious to see if we could capture that in the soil test. Uh, and we did. We pulled 28 GPS reference point from points from the field boundary uh, in the fall of 2016. And these points, they will always be replicated now every three years because we're using a three-year crop rotation. Um, and we use that to evaluate the soil amendments that are you know, part of our production plan to balance our soil out. So on the following maps, I'm going to show a few of these. The yellow or lighter colors uh, mean low levels, whether it's a surface analysis or whether it's a fertilizer rate. Uh, the darker, deeper colors are the high levels and our soil pH average um, on this particular uh, map is 6.55 on the left. So that's not too bad. We're trying to get to 6.7. Um, but if you look below that red line, Everything there on the in the blue, that's above 7.1. So that doesn't need any lime. And it probably never will because that field's bordered by um, on the south fence line uh, gravel road that it's getting free road rock lime all summer long. So even though we're only spreading 286 pounds, we've got some relatively low spots that we're receiving over 500 pounds of pell lime. And then, of course, that portion in the southern part, which is over 10 acres, uh, is never, never probably ever going to get lime. Uh, same with the phosphorus. Uh, I'm going to breeze through these next ones. Uh, and I'll revisit this phosphorus in a little bit because something crazy happened in phosphorus level uh, levels in the farm over that three-year period. And uh, I'll hammer on that in a minute. But uh, if you remember... My potassium levels were were down in the 70s, and that's really about half what we want. Um, and I just point this out because we're putting 300 pounds of potash on while we do this build to try to get things in check. So those applications combined with our cropping system changed this farm, uh, in my opinion, pretty quickly. And it showed up on the soil test. So 28 replicated sites, we increased CEC from 10.93 to 12. Uh, I think this is due mainly to our soil organic matter increases, and, and that's on the right there from 2.39% to 2.75%. So if you remember, Neil from the NRCS said three times the top growth measurement um, could be used as an estimate for total biomass from what that multi-species cover crop following wheat uh, would look like in 2018. And if 1% soil organic matter weighs 10 tons to the acre, uh, and we have increased on average 3.87 tons of dry biomass per acre based off those percentages. So to me, being uh, a farmer and a, a purveyor of common sense, uh, I would say we stopped losing soil. And um, I don't think we could have done that without cover crops and, and planting green. And I also think by incorporating small grains, we have likely been able to increase soil organic matter um, the numbers are very close. Uh, more applications are probably needed to prove or disprove that. But as you can see, it went the right direction. So that's very cool for me. I'm not degrading anything. I'm enhancing things. I feel good. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, and like I said, I was going to hit on this phosphorus topic. On the left of this slide, we have the Bray P1 test results. And on the right, we have Bray P2. Bray P2 is a measurement of the total phosphorus, and we're just not going to talk about that today, but it's important information to know how much phosphorus is actually there versus how much is, you know, accessible to the plants. It's a different extraction method in the lab. Um, 
we want to look at the break P1 uh, or the plan available number. So in my multi-year build, I adjusted based off crop rotation and, and the yield to maintain 25 parts per million. However, we underapplied the build balance portion of this formula because we initially were doing a four-year multi-year uh, analysis and build. So we we're supposed to be adjusting that by 25%. Um, but since I only did this for three years, I should have adjusted over 33% to get my algorithm and the script that I was applying to do its job. So we we just skipped the last year is what we ended up doing because I realized I needed to retest to see where I was at. Plus, I just couldn't wait anymore because I knew my soils had changed so much that I just, I, it was a good time to resample. And so we just scrapped the old plan and we adjusted and now we're in a different plan. But because we did that, we underapplied 25% of the build balance portion. Um, and at the same time, the test results went up by six parts per million. I have never seen that before in my career. And um, I can't really say, you know, on this platform, or you'd have to know me better if you don't know me at all. This is probably the, one of the most exciting things that I ever saw as far as in the context of the work that I do. So there's just so much value in the spread between what I had applied and what I got. And we're seeing an increase of, you know, almost 25%, but we under applied by 25% on the build balance. And that's just, it's such a huge deal to me. And it should be to everyone pondering how or why to incorporate continuous cover. And the point goes further you know, than cost savings. It means efficiency. It, we've, we've, we've had three soybean crops on that farm. And as my yields go up, the cost of production per bushel goes down. So we aren't spending more on inputs to get it done, but the yield gains are there to lessen the load per bushel anyway. Um, and by the time we got to last year, my break-even cost was beginning to drop. So from 565, 504, um, and we're starting to account for the fertilizer uptake. Um, we're using less herbicides, less seed treatments, and that that helped us get from a break-even cost of 1160 per bushel of soybeans all the way down to seven. Uh, 68. And that's in a five-year period. Now, I'm not saying I didn't completely screw up marketing those soybeans and not make um, as much as I should have, but even I can't screw up uh, 776 break-even production costs. Um, and my, I'm guessing most, most folks uh, would have an easy time with it too. So there's still more to the story than just the, the financial stuff. The humbling part I think to me is once our farms come into disrepair like this one was, uh, we end up spending a lot of money to fix them. Somebody does, or they don't, but uh, there's no way to cut corners when things go bad. Uh, and we're using less herbicides and seed treatments and applied fertilizers really only slightly down from the prior years. We just still have a lot of work to do. We're doing really what we know is the best production plan we can make and we're executing it and we're letting the rest sort itself out. So there's continual, um, and there always will be unprofitable portions, I think, within this field boundary. And that's what this map is detailing on the right. The red is bad, the green is good. It's, it's crazy because some of those acres are making over $300 an acre growing soybeans, you know? And then some of them are losing like $100 an acre. So it, I'm making money, it's just, how do you learn how to fix all this stuff? And it's just, you got to keep chiseling away at one variable and isolate it and get after it. And I just remind myself that, um, you know, I know where I started and I know where I'm trying to go, but the destination is kind of unknown. I mean, it really is. And I also remind myself to embrace the grind uh, and just accept the responsibility that comes with working on the land. You know, clean water and adequate nutrition have been, and, and, there, and it is always going to be our burden to bear. And if we can find more efficient ways to do it, we may be able to make a nice living while we, while we do, we, we're really doing this kind of work that is likely more important than any of us really understand. Um, and this all fits our mindset because we believe cultural practices are more powerful tools. Uh, what we have built is a more resilient, more profitable system. 
And this is how we're going to sustain not only our operations, but our communities, our food supply chain, uh, and our workspace. And that all takes good old fashioned uh, farmer ingenuity. Um, you know, you just don't, you don't add anything and you don't take anything away, you change, you know. Um, and you don't change just one thing. You, you shift the mindset to a whole farm and good things just start to happen. Uh, one of the major components of that continuous cover, especially in the northern regions where we're working uh, of this country, is interseeding. And Danny and Kelsey had asked me to, to talk about that. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and get right into that. Um, we track GDUs. Uh, to determine the best time to apply. And so what we're, what we're really going to try to target is uh, that red line is corn physiological maturity. Okay, so that would, um, that would usually come for us if we get planted on time at the end of August or the first week of September, hopefully in August. And so we'll work the um, weather within that window to determine start date. And we don't base start date off of beans because we mainly want to get in front of their leaf drop and after a few years of doing this i just don't think you can lose with beans that's just my opinion so i, I if you have your video turned up i think you'll be able to hear the seed drop but you, you'll probably be able to see it too um this is the only video i got from last year a little lag on my end um, but it's as easy as that and super fast, obviously not a precision seeder, um, but it gets a lot done in a hurry. And, and on average, why we're doing that, um, we're going to get 600 growing degree units from, uh, the first month after application. And then after that, for just the one example in 2020, re we received 150 GDUs, um, before the killing frost arrived in October. So by interseeding we're getting about you know three to four times gdu accumulation before the crop is off um and that's really helping us get established and that's going to help us get the results that we're after um we've had success uh putting it through the airplane uh soybeans ahead of leaf drop you know that creates a mulch for us and that mulch can hold enough moisture to germinate cover crops even in the absence of rain we've had them germinate just with heavy dew and you know the seedlings you can see are just going to blow right through that uh, decaying material on the ground in the soybean field and as i said corn is a little bit trickier because uh it's shaded and there's not as much residue falling on the ground so we're really trying to find that that perfect opportunity where we can catch a rain um when the top of the plants are starting to yellow back that's right around physiological maturity so if you remember the seeds don't do much the first day you drop them we're going to get ahead of that everything gets lighter warmer and we're extending our window for an opportunity to catch the rain so here's a few pictures just i'm pretty sure we've all probably seen some of this by now ju judging by the full questions again in corn and so just a couple things that we've noticed uh things to watch for during harvest you know, beans can be a little trickier if you have a tremendous amount of top growth. One one common thing I hear from from growers is that uh, if you get a heavy dew set in at night, it'll like shut your combine down pretty quick. You know, and it starts to slug, but you got cover crops in there, it, it'll stop you. So that's one thing we found. Um, the other thing is just wheel traffic. If you if you got to get in your field and track up your field because it's muddy and you got to get your crop out, I mean that sucks anyway, but if that's never a good situation but cover crops are super resilient and they can take a lot it's it's actually amazing uh what they can do so one one cover crop seed doesn't change the world but a million in an acre do and that's i always remind myself of that so and likewise one farmer won't change the world but if, if we can keep up the adoption of these uh continuous cover and, and never till practices i think that we would change the world i really do and i and the same as before on these maps here, yellow is low, lower levels and uh, the blue is high. And these numbers are calculated by the NRCS. So the percentage of cover per watershed um, is this map with the aerial seeding. And as you can see, we're over 40% concentrated 
uh, into some of these watersheds. And every watershed in Crawford County uh, has interseeded cover crops. So good job, Crawford County. I'm actually super amazed by that. Um, a few years ago, there wasn't hardly any interseeding, so it's it's really picking up quick. Um, we've gained over a thousand tons of soil organic matter in some of those watersheds, and we've also sequestered over a thousand tons of carbon in uh, several of those watersheds. So remember the plan available phosphorus from our soil testing and the cost savings. Well, the NRCS also documented that. And on the left map, we've got like a conservative or low level um, for lower biomass accumulations. Then on the right, we've got like a higher level. And that's just a range of accepted uh, values that the NRCS uses. So we primarily look at our mixes, barley, rye, uh, and medium red clover. And those acres in the application would vary, obviously, within that spectrum. But in some watersheds, I mean, we're looking at thousands, thousands of dollars. Um, and those are real costs to the producers, the taxpayers, the community members. Uh, it's everybody's problem, you know, uh, and, it's, and it's everybody's problem to solve. <laughs> so um, to come full circle, water holding capacity, uh, hundreds of gallons of, of water held within these watersheds. Um, and that means, you know, eventually if we, if we stick with this system, um, there's an exponential gain that can happen and, and eventually cover crops are going to pay us back. And this slide's taken from a different presentation. It's pretty in depth. Um, it, it's showing that it does take time for cover crops to pay, but once they start to pay, they really pay big. Um, and as I said, it takes an entire community and our community preserves 78,404 and a half tons of topsoil in the landscape over 37,000 acres. So that's the equivalent of 3,917 truckloads of dirt kept out of our watersheds and in our workspace. So it takes a lot of collaboration between government, private business and, and the willing uh, participants, the producers that are doing the work to make all this stuff happen. So in conclusion, uh, we're heading in the right direction locally. Uh, more cover equals better outcomes. Interseeding, you know, helps to make that happen. And we have a long, we just have a long ways to go. We got a lot of good stuff, but the work has not even hardly begun. Um, the NRCS has the playbook. I mentioned them a lot. They're not good at advertising for themselves and I'll advertise for them all day. I'm a big advocate of our local team and it takes them, they're so smart. If you have a good district conservationist, which we're lucky to have a couple locally, they can just do and help you do anything. Um, matching operation goals to the playbook tends to ensure profitable uh, and sustainable outcomes. So don't, <clears throat> what I always say to people, talk to your district conservationist, but don't sign up for pro uh, programs that you can't or don't tend to obligate, okay? There's a lot of other, Things. I mean, the rules change annually, but the intent's always going to stay the same. The government just moves slow, and, and that's probably by design. But the NRCS is a science-based division inside the USDA, and, and there may be some political triggers, but the folks working there generally want to see this stuff through. So the big areas of focus are, and I think will continue to be, soil testing and variable rate fertilizer uh, and other technology with variable rate, no-till. Uh, cover crops and perennial vegetation. So uh, in summary, interseeding, all that stuff, interseeding gives us time. Um, if you're a livestock producer, uh, you have an opportunity to make inexpensive feed uh, and you have some flexibility in what kind of feed you're gonna make. Um, I think follow through is essential. Making a plan with deadlines and contingencies you know, things are going to change with cover cropping. I think about um, planting green and getting to that point. You know, if you aren't already doing that, try to figure it out. Start with soybeans. They're easy. It's transformative and it's amazing what that does. Uh, the benefit, you know, ultimately is increased soil organic matter and increased soil organic matter. If none of the uh, cultural stuff trips trigger, it's money in your pocket. So you can uh, do the right thing and make more money doing it. I, I firmly believe that and I'm living proof of that. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude the formalized portion of all this. I wanna thank all the producers that I work with for teaching us how to get it done. I wanna thank the Wall Center 
and Tanner Creek watershed people there have been awesome to me and just local group that's really cool if the, if anybody's on the presentation they probably saw 50 to 60 percent of those slides already so if you made it to the end and you're from Tanner Creek you're just a champ and uh Danny and Kelsey thanks for inviting me and and then also just anybody that's on the call here today for taking time to hear our story so uh, I always say this and I mean it, but feel free to contact me on the contact information I have listed there. And with that, I'm done. Thanks. Thank you, Adam, for the great presentation. This is great. And there are uh, several folks from Tanner Creek that are still hanging in there. So, and they are champs. <laughs> Here, we've got a few questions and, and I've compiled a few. So we'll jump right into the question and answer section. Kind of going back to when we talked about the guamelin, um, how does the fungi work with the fertilizer and do you see any change on the glomalin when you put put on any chemical? I never changed anything I did with herbicides or my synthetic fertilizers and the hyphae growth. I mean, we couldn't even find any on the farm and I never changed anything with that. So I would say in my personal experience on that farm, I don't think that matters. I think not tilling the land. I mean, that's obviously how you get it going. So we don't we don't put anything, we don't inject anything. The only thing that enters the soil surface on our farm is the disc openers on the planter. I think that's the most important thing is just never till that land. And the other stuff I'm not I'm not an expert on that, but we haven't seen that that's inhibited any growth and no one's told me otherwise. So when you kind of were mentioning a little bit about the flying on the seed, it appears to me that it might be a little bit more challenging to target the right time for application in corn, right? With those cha the timing challenges, if you also have an extra, you know, a, a weedier field or weedier series of fields or more trash in the on the ground, is there anything that you'd suggest um, maybe doing instead or um, anything that you could apply with the seed to kind of uh, get a better, get a better stand, I guess, or the seeds take off? I think the main thing is just, we've jacked with it a lot of different ways on the, on the date itself. So to answer that question first, I think you're better off being early than late. And especially if you watch like rainfall and you watch temperatures and I mean, people, people make fun of me pretty bad because I got like a lot of charts and I'm pretty huh? sick about it. In August, I get pretty crazy about when we're gonna, cause you gotta get a lot of infrastructure to the airport to get a lot done in a hurry. And I really like a tight window. So like when we go, I wanna go. And I don't wanna think about dragging it out for a month. I, I, I know that's the right time, so we wanna get it done. Um, so if I can play the weather, like it's climate and you know kind of the history of your area and where you're applying it to, so you know, generally you're gonna be in the last part of August or maybe the first part of September. So that's not very tricky. But like this year, if it stays hot and we push this crop along and say we're like mid July and God forbid that we have problems, but if it gets really bad and really dry, we'd probably be earlier. So I'm just, I'm watching that the whole way through. And then you, you're just gonna, you have to get within two or three weeks really and if it rains, if there's a tornado somewhere or a monsoon down in the Gulf or, you know, something like that, I mean, you just watch that stuff and it'll, it'll bring something. It just, something's got to change that time of year and you get in front of that and then you get a great take. Weedy fields, all that stuff. I don't think it really matters that much. Uh, as long as you have, you know, the, the timing right and you get some rain and then one thing I'd add to that, like if you got a weed problem, I wonder, you know, some of the things that we found where we have poorer takes is like, just no offense to anybody, but poor management. I mean, they got fertility levels or pH, especially if pH is screwed up, their corn, your corn gets tall and looks like corn and beans generally do too. But small grains are like a litmus paper. I mean, they don't, if, if you got bad pH, they don't grow very well. Um, and I don't think your field crops probably do either, whether you know it or not. So there's some things like that where I think current soil tests and keeping track of stuff 
the better things grow, the better they grow. I, I don't know why that is. It's just, it seems like when things are right, everything goes good. And when they're not, it's really hard to get things rolling. So weed problems to me are usually indicative of something else. Um, unless you know you just blew your second pass and didn't do it or whatever, you know, I mean, stuff happens that's odd, but mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Yep, yep, it was a complex question, so thank you. <laughs> um, so looking at your map, you have great coverage in Crawford County and we'd have just a couple spots in, in Vernon. So as we continue to kind of look a little bit more north, what um, what are some of the things that we can do, you know, in terms of, you know, farmers in Vernon County or, or neighbors working together to help um, increase coverage or, you know, expand this direction? That's a great question. I think the logistics... I probably asked you six times already. <laughs> Sorry. But but I, maybe I haven't got the answer I was looking for yet, Adam. <laughs> yeah, the answer is not as easy. When, when we first started in Crawford County, it was kind of a slow go, you know, until... I mean, we had tremendous support from uh, the NRCS office there. And we do in Grant County, too. And I'm not saying we don't in Vernon. Um, but that's just a little bit further away from where... I have a network of people, you know. Um, I would just say, if you, if you want to if you want to use an airplane, I do think it's good to like get a neighborhood together. I, I really do. Like, if you could, you could probably dispatch an airplane for a day's worth of work, which would be like a thousand to fifteen hundred acres. I think any pilot um, would do that, or if they wanted to, if they want to make money, they would. Um, but if you have like 200 acres you want to do or a bunch of different mixes, that's really not a good idea um, to get a project off the ground. I'm not saying down the road we couldn't do more of that, but we keep it so very simple. Like we're doing 45 pounds of rye and two pounds of medium red clover. And then for folks that don't want the small grain to overwinter, we're doing 55 pounds of spring barley and two pounds of medium red clover. The pilots like it because there's not a lot of calibration and it's a good mix. So. I think when we're we we can get a little bit too cute with that and try to do a bunch of crazy stuff and I mean that time of year and what we're how we're applying it I think it's just better to keep it simple. So if you get some get some folks together, if folks are interested in dispatching planes in Vernon County, we're gonna have four planes uh, here that time of year. So it's not a big problem for us to add acres to the project. And if you're not we do a lot through equip but we do a lot of just folks that like using cover crops so um they generally do exactly the same thing that we're doing but you wouldn't necessarily have to spread probably as many seeds as we do but to suffice the equip contracting that we do the district offices have a certain seeds per square foot based off the tags and stuff so we're putting a pretty heavy rate on compared to i think what you probably have to if you're just a private sector guy that just want to fly some crops on Mm -hmm. And that would cheapen it up quite a bit too. So it's it's crazy, but if you get a big pile of it together like we've got now, it's really not any more expensive to use an airplane than a ground drill. It's just not. So you, you mentioned equip and some of the funding. Is there um any recommendations that you could make to help farmers who are interested in finding different funding sources or what who do they talk to directly? Who who can help them get started in helping to um, maybe cost share on some of this fly on seating. You can go right into your NRCS office and talk to your district conservationist. I mean, that's one way of doing it. If some of the contracts are a little bit cumbersome and we, this kind of surprised me a little bit. My wife always takes care of that stuff on our farm. So <laughs> I never really looked at it that close until we started doing more of this work. And, and it is tricky. I think that's one of the biggest things. Make sure if you're going to turn in something, turn it in and fill it out right because they just can't. The federal government can't accept paperwork that's not properly filled out. So we have a lot of producers that actually bring their stuff in the office and Tasia or Kelly fills it out for them and brings it in. I mean, we can do POAs and AOPs and all that stuff and take care of the contracts even. And that's been pretty easy for us. Like we have tons of guys that are contracted through our office and then we we actually take ownership of the project. So whether it wins or loses, you know, we, we have some skin in the game there. And um, folks seem to really like that. That's one way to do it. You can find a private sector place. I don't know if there's a lot of places that are doing like what we're doing, but if you need help with that, 
Uh, I'm not trying to promote my business on this call, but we do that. You can. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it sounds it sounds like that'd be a great direction for folks, especially if they're just trying to figure it out or get established. That definitely touch base with you and it, um, you kind of the whole project management. Sure. Yep. Sounds good. The hardest part is getting started. So. Well, we're at time for the webinar, but I wanted to thank Adam for his great presentation and sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. And Danny, always great to co-host with you. And the webinar will be available um, next week if you want to share it with everyone that you know. So I just want to say thank you everyone for attending today and keep an eye out for uh, the next webinar.